Hi guys, how are you doing? So I'm about to do a little bit of cooking and I thought I'd bring you guys along with me because it's not something that I really share that often with you, even though I do a tremendous amount of it. Anyway, what I'm about to cook right now, it really fits so many different things. So I've done two recent podcast episodes. One was on sauces and cooking sauces and another one was with Alan talking about, you know, cooking from scratch. Well, Alan from the Urban Homesteading UK podcast came to visit me a little while ago and as a thank you for our hospitality, I suppose, he gave us, among other things, this homemade cider. And I thought, what better use for it than to pair it with our homegrown pork and our homegrown vegetables. So I'm gonna make a, basically a pork and cider casserole today. And uh, so this is a shoulder of pork or most of a shoulder of pork been cut there you can see add another section um, and I cooked this yesterday because we just we needed the room in our freezer so I had to take it out of the freezer a few days ago and defrost it um, cooked it yesterday so I'm now going to basically dice this up and then we're going to use some onions and carrots in our sauce and obviously this lovely cider we're going to also use so when I cook this it gave off an awful lot of juices. We've saved those and they're going to have separated down here. So that top layer is some really clean fat and that bottom layer is just this amazingly dense stock. So we'll separate that fat out and that fat will go into one of our fat jars where again, we'll re you can see we've been reusing this for frying in. So we will actually use some of that fat at the top to fry our onions in. And like I say, the stock will go into the sauce and I'll talk you through that as we go. But you know, we're just, we're using all of the byproducts that we get from cooking and we're using all of our homemade produce. produce. And what I love about things like casseroles at this time of year is you get to add whatever vegetables you've got. So we've got a glut at the moment of beans. So we're gonna add loads of beans and courgettes as our vegetables with our stock and then it's just going to be, it's just going to be amazing. So uh, yeah, let's get to it. So the first thing I need to do is dice these onions. So we'll chop these onions up and then uh, add them to a frying pan or add them to a, a big pan, actually a big cooking pot with some oil in and, and fry them off. Next up some garlic. Now this is garlic from our perennialized garlic. So it grows like this and these are just so strong in terms of flavor. You need much less than you might otherwise think. And that just wants about 30 seconds or so now. You see how the onion has started to go translucent? And the garlic, like I say, literally wants about 30 seconds in that oil. And the next thing we'll do is we'll add our cider. Now I don't drink, but I have done that uh, old wine tasters trick of tasting it and spitting it out. Uh, I don't drink alcohol but I do cook with it quite a lot. And uh, what we're gonna do now is we're basically, we're gonna add all this and this is a beautiful, I would describe it as a dry cider. Alan, tell me if I'm wrong. But we're gonna add all of this now in here because I want all of that flavor. We've got quite a lot of pork to pair it with. So I don't think that's too much. And then we're going to allow that now to reduce down to probably about a third or even less and what's going to happen is all of the alcohol is effectively going to boil away. And that's how you would distill alcohol. That's one of the ways you would distill it and make really strong, strong drinks like vodka and what have you. You would basically make your regular alcohol and then you would distill it by boiling away the alcohol and capturing that steam. But we're going to do the opposite. We're actually going to release the steam and we're going to use what's left because 
It won't have the alcohol content, but it will have that amazing flavor. So we're gonna reduce this down now. And while that's happening, I shall dice up the pork. So that's all the pork in there now. And I've actually got to go to the garage, pick up my car, which has just been in for an MOT. So I'm leaving my boys <laughs> to, uh, they basically formed a conveyor belt for the spuds. So these are obviously the spuds out the garden and we are cooking potato wedges, which is the easiest thing in the world. Cut them like this. I'm not gonna pre-boil them. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. You don't need to, you really, really don't. I'm just putting them in that water so that they don't go off. Obviously, once they're cut, if you let the air get to them, they'll go that horrible grey colour. They're going to be ready, and when I get back from picking my car up, we'll finish this off. So I've just got home and uh, back to this. So I'm going to add now all of that amazing stock from here. So much good flavor in there. And as you can see, the fat will just stay there now. Really easy to separate. And we're gonna bring that back up to a boil. Now, the next thing I want to do is my vegetables. Now, what I would have done if I was here for the whole time that this was gonna be boiling, in an ideal world, you'd have this on a light, light simmer for a couple of hours. And if in an ideal world I'd have been here to do that, I would have added all my vegetables and they'd have all cooked in there. Because I haven't had that luxury today, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get a couple of other pans on, one with boiling water and one with a bit more of the fat. And we're going to fry off some courgettes and we're gonna boil some beans, just lightly boil, part boil, and then add them to this. And then they can carry on cooking in there for another 20 minutes or so. Like I say, in an ideal world, I would have done all that cooking in one pan, but that didn't work out. Next up, potato wedges, but I've got to go and milk my goats. So I will talk to you about that when I get back or while I'm out there, depending on what the weather does, because it is raining at the moment. Right then, a quick word on potato wedges and everything I'm about to say about potato wedges, you can also apply to roast potatoes. Now, if I've got guests coming and I'm doing a really fancy dinner and you know, there are some things you can do with a lot of the things you eat that are an extra step, some extra work and they make the tiniest amount of difference. So on my regular cooking jaunts or if I've not got much time, there are steps that you can skip. And I'm going to suggest that the part boiling of your potatoes is one such step because when you think about and what it does, and when you compare the results, there's very, very, very little difference. Now, as far as I can tell, the advantage of part boiling your potatoes, if you're making roast potatoes, or if you're making wedges, is what it does is it basically, well, it changes the consistency of the outside of the potatoes. We all know how a raw potato feels, and if you cut a raw potato in half, it's very, very solid, isn't it? And it would be, you know, you'd have to use your fingernail to make a dent in it. And we equally know, hey Sydney, be with you in a second. We equally know what a boiled potato feels like. It's soft and you could literally squeeze it between your finger and thumb and crush it. So the idea of part boiling your potatoes before you put them in the oven is that it basically softens that outside and causes it to, when you run it through your colander and shake it about a bit, it causes it to sort of fluff up and make little rough edges. And it basically massively increases the surface area if done correctly. This in turn increases the uptake of the oil that you're cooking it in effectively, giving you a really, really crispy outside. Now from experience, not doing that, the only thing you miss out on really is that very slight change in the outside of the potato insofar as how it takes up the oil. But if you are diligent in your actual cooking of the potatoes, and what I do 
when I'm cooking potato wedges or roast potatoes is I put the potatoes in the pan, in the pan that they're gonna go in the oven in with the oil. And I've already put the fat in those pans and I've put them in the oven first. My wife's gonna put the spuds in for me while I'm out here. But what I think is really important is when you then transfer your potatoes onto that tray, I make a point of getting a ladle, a metal ladle, and I actually coat each individual potato, make sure each individual potato is coated on all sides by the oil. And then I bang that in the oven and boom, you're good to go. Now I put them in the oven at about 180 to 190 and they're gonna take around half an hour, 40 minutes, something like that. All ovens vary, ours is super fast, so bear that in mind. But basically, you know they're cooked by the look of them. And I'll show you how they look when they're ready in a minute. But like I say, you can really skip that step of part boiling and you don't really lose very much. So give it a go and see what you think. I've got to pick up my carrots. <laughs> so I've got to go back out and grab them. While I'm doing this, it's actually a great time to talk about one other thing, and that is boiling vegetables. I don't know how old you are, dear viewer, but I am in my mid forties and my grandmother, and it was passed on to a certain extent to my parents, I'm sure, they had the tradition of boiling vegetables until they were really, really soft. Since then, the prevailing wisdom has changed and now we would, I know this isn't the term, but a term we would normally apply to pasta, we would kind of think the same way about our vegetables, al dente, a firm bite. And there's several reasons for both of these decisions, for both of these ways of cooking vegetables. They're both culinary and cultural. So the first thing to think about is the taste. And of course, we all know that if you cook vegetables too long and they get mushy, a lot of the taste actually disappears. It goes into the water. Well, that's a double-edged sword because when my grandmother was younger, that flavor seeping out into the water wasn't a negative. It was actually a positive because they wanted that water for stocks to make soups and whatever else you're gonna make stocks from. You know, that vegetable stock, that vegetable water, if it was a roast dinner, that certainly would have been the basis of a gravy. Whereas modern day cooking, we tend to discard the water that we cook our vegetables in, and that's a mistake. So even though I'm not going to be cooking my vegetables for very long, some of the flavor of the vegetables does seep out into that water. Now there's several ways you can look at this and things you can do about it. So firstly, if you're not gonna be cooking your vegetables very long, there's not gonna be a tremendous amount of flavor that comes out into that water. So what can we do? Well, we can actually save that water and use it to cook vegetables in multiple times, almost like a master stock, and the flavor will build up over time. But there's other ways we can maximize that flavor. So what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be using the bare minimum of water just to cover my vegetables so that I'm getting the maximum flavor to water ratio, if you like. So we don't need masses and masses of water, just enough to cover our veggies. Right, so let's get these guys in and part boil them and then they will go on into that casserole and then the water we will also save and we're going to be part boiling our green beans as well and again that water will save and that's going to go into the casserole as well because at the moment all we've got in there if you remember is the cider which we've reduced down considerably and that stock and that stock is really concentrated as well so what we've got is masses and masses of flavor but not very much actual liquid. So we're gonna add the liquid from our veggies, which again is gonna add a little bit of flavor. It's gonna be a really weak vegetable stock, but it's gonna add that liquid that we need. The last thing we'll need to do to our sauce is to thicken it if we want to. And we're just gonna use flour for that. So that's our carrots in just there. And as you can see, there's just enough water to cover them. That water was on the boil and obviously that's reduced in temperature because we've put them in. My wife's just preparing some green beans over there, which are gonna go in that pan. And in here, we're gonna turn that up now and melt that fat ready to cook our courgettes. And we're just gonna flash fry them, gonna get it up to a nice high temperature and then fry them for maybe a minute, turning them all the time, and then they're gonna go in here. So I'm just about to add my courgette in here and I've turned that up to maximum. Another tip for when you're frying almost anything, and you'll hear this sizzle when I put it in, is 
almost anything you fry, but certainly vegetables, they're gonna give off moisture. Whatever you're frying them for, there's a reason that you're choosing to fry them and not boil them. Whatever that reason might be, depending on the vegetable, depending on the recipe. But it's really important that the heat in your pan and the temperature that you have it on is high enough that it can boil off the moisture that's coming out of the vegetable as fast as it comes off. Otherwise what's gonna happen is that moisture is gonna build up in the pan and you'll end up boiling them instead of frying them. So it's really, really important to have that temperature nice and high. Like I say, otherwise that moisture will end up boiling them. That's something actually came up on a podcast episode I recorded with Alan from the Urban Home Studying UK podcast just recently. I'm not sure if it's been released yet, but um, just interesting. That's come up twice in a matter of a few days. But here we go, so we're nearly there. They've been boiling for a minute or two now, so we're gonna drain them, gonna save the water, add the water in here if we need it. Although having said that, it does look quite, it does look like we've actually got a fair amount in there already, but it might not look that way by the time we've added the vegetables. So we'll just have to wait and see. So you can see the color difference in that water there that's had the carrots in it. Right, so we're pretty much there now. The, we're just waiting for the beans to catch up with everything else. I've just added the first ingredient to this that we haven't produced ourselves, and that is some tarragon. Now we do grow some tarragon here, but we haven't got very much of it, and I'm saving it for September for myself. So we've added some shop-bought tarragon. We're gonna also add some corn flour to thicken it. A Couple of teaspoons, mix some water in there just to thicken it up. But otherwise, everything in there, the sauce, the stock, the vegetables, the meat, everything, and the potato wedges that are in the oven have all come from our garden. And I'll thicken it with, like I say, just some corn flour. Another couple of tips just to add at the end here. So if you are going to use herbs to flavor things, a great rule of thumb that you can't really go very wrong by is you would add spices at the beginning to add that depth of flavor. When you're frying things off, usually that's when the spices would go in. And then you would add your herbs right at the end. Now I ended up adding all of the water from the carrots into this. I don't think we're going to need, what do you think love? How much more gravy does that need? More or none? None. So we're not going to add any more water from the beans, but as you can see, see the color change there. It just goes to show that's not water anymore. You know, it's a weak vegetable stock. So we can either freeze that for use later to, you know, cook more vegetables in and deepen the flavor in both those vegetables and the stock and build up over time. That's sort of a, a master stock, you would call that. Or we could just put it in the fridge. We're going to use it soon. And this is coming together nicely. I'm just gonna add my corn flour now. One last thing to bear in mind, whenever you're thickening with corn flour, it's really important that you give it a good five or six minutes minimum, preferably 10 or more, at that temperature, because that's gonna cook the flour off and avoid you having that floury taste in the food. So there you go, I'll be having this in September with our, with our own tarragon and our own salt. But uh, as you can see, that is a beautiful pork and cider casserole with potato wedges. Completely self-sufficient meal. Thanks for watching everyone. Please make sure you press that like button for me. It makes a big difference as I'm trying to grow the channel. Leave me a comment down below. Let me know your meal ideas. Let me know if you're gonna have a go at this one. And also make sure if you're not already that you subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching guys. Cheers.